Okay, let's let's get started. Can you please take a seat and please close the door too? It'd be nice. I'm equally sure that they uh, they might prioritize. Yeah. Okay. Welcome everyone. This is sick dispatch, so let's get going. This is the note well, uh, so hopefully you're already familiar with this. Uh, this uh, governs everything that we do at the ITF, uh, so please uh, get familiar with this if you're not. Um, meeting tips, make sure if you're in person here, please um, use the meet echo um, application to allow us to know how many people are in, in, in this room and to be able to join uh, the queue here. Um, and if you use the, the full um, client, please make sure that audio and video are off. And if you're remote, um, make sure that uh, audio and video are off uh, if you're not speaking. A reminder, uh, sick dispatch, um, it has some ground rules about how we work here. Uh, so uh, SIG Dispatch recommends next steps. It doesn't do any work here. Um, possible outcomes, uh, either we direct it to an existing work group, propose a new focus to a work group, AD sponsor, additional discussion is needed, or ITF should not work on this. So the agenda for today, we have uh, Yeah, um, so it's gonna, it's gonna be Dave, uh, David will start with the application client certificate. Um, and then um, Yoav will talk about hybrid signature method. Um, after that, Ben Schwartz will be talking about uh, source address validation. Uh, and Justin will uh, finish with the SPIFI. Okay, any questions, any? Bashes to the agenda here. If not, David. Good morning. Um, excellent. Thank you. Somebody's sharing it. So, yeah, everybody knows this problem, I think. Um, can we flip to the next slide, please? Um, if anybody has ever tried using um, client certs, even server certs with um, um, web servers, anything else, it is hard to do this sensibly. Um, you get certificates issued in all kind of random formats from corporate um, PKI, PKI infrastructure, um, and users cannot work out how to take the file or whatever they've been given, the security token they've been given, and make it work with an application. And this means that users don't use security tokens. They don't use a TPM, despite them having been ubiquitous for is it, can I say decades now? Um, and they use files. Some applications don't even support using passphrases on certificates, on key files. Um, and even when secure storage is supported, different applications vary on how you specify the, which key to use from token. Um, and even a, a given application will change how that works depending on which crypto library it happens to have been built against for your um, environment, for your Linux distribution or whatever. Um, so next slide, please. Um, yeah, there's also system certificate stores. Most platforms these days will have their own secure or relatively secure database for key storage. Um, there's PKCS11 used for accessing um, crypto tokens, the TPM, of course, and then a plethora of different file formats, which can be either PEM text format or DER binary as well. So moving on, please. And then we get to passphrase handling. PKCS8 doesn't actually mandate a character set. So if you have non-ASCII passwords, that may or may not work, depending on the environment. And yes, key storage. Keys are supposed to be local to a, 
a given machine generally where you don't share keys that's not really what they're for but even then um, differences between applications will um, will cause problems even pkcs 12 which mandates um, essentially utf-16 um, in, in a bmp string um, there are lots of different ways to get that wrong as well and we've seen fairly ubiquitous libraries doing silly things like converting the local 8-bit character set, whatever it be, even if it's not ISO 8859-1, to BMP string by simply interspersing zeros with every other byte. Um, and that bug was eventually fixed by um, assuming UTF-8 instead of assuming ISO 8859-1. Um, and there are plenty of PKCS12 implementations which don't support anything but um, ancient um, PBESs. Um, so moving on, please. I mean, to a certain extent, this degenerates into a rant, right? How do I use the key in my token? Well, it depends which application, which crypto library. Um, there are different ways. There is a standard for this, RFC 7512 gives a URI for identifying PKCS11 objects. Um, a handful of applications use it, not very many. I've been fixing a whole bunch of them over the years. Um, and then there's a question of whether your actual provider library is installed um, and whether the system can automatically discover it or not. Um, and there's tools for that on sort of Unix like systems, P11 kit, um, but a lot of applications don't use the, to the providers which are configured therein. Um, next slide is TPM, I think, please. Um, same problem there. So there are two different OpenSSL engines for using keys which are either within stored within a TPM NB RAM or um, wrapped by it. So you have a, a, an encrypted version of the key in a, in a PEM file. Um, until I got them together and bashed their heads together a little bit, they were using different file formats for storing their keys, differently generated um, hierarchy root keys, um, ephemeral keys for encrypting the files. Um, but now at least we do have a standard which I've linked from, from my draft, which they, um, they both work with. Um, but using TPMs with a whole bunch of software involves knowing that that software has been built against OpenSSL, manually specifying the engine name and then the file name. Whereas you should just be able to give it the PEM file, which begins, which says begin TSS2 key blob, and it should just work, right? So next slide, please. Certificate stores have the same issue. They are sporadically supported and there aren't really standard um, methods of identifying the keys therein, right? There is, um, there's a, there was a certificate identifier draft um, a few years ago, which is linked from my last slide, but it didn't really go anywhere. And it's, um, I'm not sure it's the right thing, but again, it's hard to use the, even the platform certificate store in most applications. Next slide goes on to files. So can I just use files? Well, I touched on that earlier, right? There's a whole bunch of different file types. A random subset of them will be supported by any given application. Um, and yes, if you have not ASCII passwords, you you get a whole bunch of different pain from that as well. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this should just be easy, right? Whatever I have, if I have a key and a token, I should just be able to use a RFC 7512 PKCS11 URI in place of a file name or other identifier, and it should just work. If I use a file which happens to contain a TPM wrapped key, that should just work, right? And there should be a uniform way of specifying certs in the um, system system certificate store. So any application on my system that I try and use keys with should just work the same way. Um, and that's basically the point in the draft. So next slide, please. Um, 
just set out exactly what the user should experience, what things an application should attempt to try. Um, and the draft talks about a, for files where um, you can try different passwords as, as often as you like, permutations of character set um, problems to try, um, etc. cetera. Um, and the idea is, um, one of the problems here is crypto libraries actively make it hard to get this right. I have literally thousands of lines of code in OpenConnect, my pet VPN application, just to make this work because it's really hard. Um, uh, so next slide, please. And that's basically the end, right? So the top of the link there is, is the draft I've put together, which is um, what I would like applications to do. A link to yeah, my pet VPN client, which I started writing in um, 2008. Um, one of the things I was doing in 2008 was um, I was working at Intel, and we evaluated the Cisco AnyConnect client for Linux. And we, um, we found it wanting. Intel really wanted to be able to use certs from a TPM at that point. Um, but it wouldn't even let us use a password on the certificate store at that point. Um, so, so we wrote our own. Um, third link there is the uh, standard for the TPM wrapped keys. Um, and the fourth is the old cert spec ID that I mentioned. And thus ends my rant. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to know what to do next yeah. with, with that draft. Yeah, K Kathleen has a question here, David. Hold on. Kathleen Moriarty. Um, my question is a clarifying one. Are you trying to change anything from PKCS 11? No. OK. All right, that's because that one is now with Oasis. You referenced the RFC, but Oasis owns the um, change control on that particular standard. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm not trying to modify anything about PKCS 11 itself. Um, the, the draft does have recommendations for how to find a certificate. Certificates can often be found without logging into a token. Um, the corresponding key you have to log in for. Um, and so there's a recommendation about if, if you have a, a cert URI, which it's a bit of a misnomer, really, because it's not unique. It's just a set of search terms. Um, you search all the available tokens. And if you find the certificate, then log in to that token, and then you'll find the key there. So there's some recommendations there about how you find the key, cert and the key given a RFC 7512 URI, but that's not a modification of PKCS 11. That's just how to use it. OK, Michael. Michael St. John's. Um, my first cut on this is that 95, 98% of this is probably not within the scope for the IETF because we generally don't do APIs. Um, the pieces respecting PKS, uh, PKS KCS 1, 8, and 12, if there are bugs, yeah, that's probably LAMPs. So that would be where I would suggest doing it. OK. Hi, Eric Rascorla. Um, I just am trying to wrap my head around the problem statement here. So let me ask some, like, try to some questions. Um, is the problem statement here that um, applications, the application A obtains a certificate and or process A obtains a certificate and application B wishes to use it, but that does not work well? Is that the major problem statement? Or is that certificates entirely contained within application A do not work well with itself? Um, it's across applications generally. Different applications are have a different user experience. And a certificate issued by a certain application or your corporation's PKIM structure or script or whatever, however it is given to you, may not work with any given application and you may not know how to do it. Um, there's a, a list I've just posted in the chat of you know, various things that have gone wrong with that over the years as examples. Right, I would like to suggest that this is an anti-pattern and rather than trying to fix that, one should not do it. And instead what we should do is the modern thing, which is to have each application on its own certificates which require via automatic processes like Acme. So, um, so, so I guess I, I think I resist the problem statement in this case, which suggests to me that probably we shouldn't do this. Daniel Khan Gilmore. 
Um, <clears throat> I am in disagreement with Ecker on this last point. Um, uh, so I encountered many of the problems that you're describing just in looking to try to make sample certificates for uh, SMIME uh, mail user agents. And that is a use case where you do actually need to uh, share keys across uh, mail user agents. If you use two mail user agents, one of them has a key. You want to use the same key in the other one so you can decrypt the same messages on both clients. There is an interoperability issue here, and it is a total disaster. You're right to call this out. Um, and I, um, I think that LAMPS uh, it would be a reasonable place to work on this. Thanks for working Which with Which one? LAMPS? LAMPS, yeah. Hi, yeah. Stephen Farrell. Uh, I more, more or less agree with DKG, um, and even with doing it in LAMPS. Uh, but uh, oh, almost, almost never. No, no, no. no. There's another, there's another presentation. Um, but uh, I mean, I would have a concern about how you kind of keep this accurate in terms of mapping to releases of various libraries. But I, I think it would be useful even if it's not 100% perfect. So I think this is uh, useful work, even if it is dealing with APIs, even if it is dealing with uh, things being handled in less than perfect ways, I think it's useful. Uh, where, where do you think should go? You want me to say do it in LAMPS again? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I didn't quite expect this to go, the mic line to go quite the way that it did. Uh, Tim Holliday, chair hat off. Um, this is going to be even funnier. Um, I'm not sure LAMPS is the right place for this. <laughs> um, I do think this is very useful work. There's, uh, you know, I do think it probably the scope should be trimmed down a little bit. I think maybe it does try to do too much and wander into the API area. And, you know, there's some stuff that I don't particularly disagree with. So I think we should probably have a conversation about what this is trying to accomplish. But there, a lot of these problems are very, very real. And so it definitely should go somewhere. My feeling for why it's maybe not LAMPS is it does feel kind of more like an application type thing instead of, uh, you know, more of just a core PKIX thing. But, uh, you know, I could be wrong about that. But uh, do you think that the conversation could start in LAMPS? The conversation could start in LAMPS. That's okay. actually a, an awesome idea, I think. Okay. Yeah. But okay. uh, we maybe we should use LAMPS to figure out where it should end up. Okay. Okay. Anybody else has uh, any other thoughts before we move on? Okay, I guess then the decision. Yeah, go ahead. Dave. Sorry, Steve, I forgot to hit the button. Uh, I mean, I think you just give it to LAMPS and let them adopt it. I mean, to, asking them to talk about it and then send it back here and back there, that's, I think, a, that, that I think is an anti pattern. Um, so. <laughs> To be clear, I think coming back here, that would be that I agree with that. Um, if we send it somewhere, we'll send it directly and we'll just talk to the chairs and you know we'll coordinate with Roman. Uh, th that's exactly what I was gonna say. Uh, let's send it to LAMPS to have a, a standing venue to kind of really refine what the edges are, kind of the scope, because that's the closest we have to a place to talk about uh, this kind of PKIX related kind of stuff. And then Paul and I are kind of committed, depending on how that conversation is go to route it to the next step if it does not end up kind of sitting there. I, of course, will remind everyone this would likely take a LAMPS recharger. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Mike St. John's again. Ben suggests I put this in, in the record, otherwise just on the thing. My recommendation was only for the PKS CS related one, eight and, and 12 stuff to go to LAMPS. The rest of it's all API stuff and okay. is, I don't think is in the scope. Okay, thanks. Sorry, also relaying from the chat, uh, as I was encouraged to do, I think it is a mistake that this community claims that we do not do API work. API is the clearest way that we can communicate the properties that we want to transmit from our protocols to developers who don't understand our protocols. But, but this is a bigger discussion, right? So Yeah, and I'm putting it on the record right now that I think it's okay. a mistake to say we don't do API work. Okay. Right, and we do it. <laughs> so stop saying we don't do it. Okay. Okay. So, so we need probably to have that discussion uh, later, but for now, we're sending this to LAMP. Okay. Uh, Yoav. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good. So let's uh, go on with the uh, next slide. Okay. So um, why am I doing this? So at ITF16 uh, in LAMPS, we decided that uh, we're going to do an adoption call for 
uh, all of uh, Mike Ownsworth's uh, drafts, including the composite signatures. And after that, I found out about this uh, a note and hybrid signature scheme that um, academic article by uh, Bindel and Hale, and proposes alternate methods of uh, creating hybrid signatures um, from uh, classic and post-quantum um, um, signature algorithms, and which offer a strong non-separability. So my plan was to wait for LAMPS to adopt the uh, Ownsworth draft and then say, oh, let's do it this other way. But uh, that didn't work out so well, so I published my own draft. Um, Next slide, yes. So what is non-separability? Well, um, uh, article... have... so, yeah. Somebody in the queue, do you want to take questions now? Or do you want to? No, no, keep going. No, <laughs> you can wait. Keep going. Uh, so uh, uh, the draft, uh, the draft, the article defines uh, several um, um, concepts. Uh, weeks non-separability is the guarantee that uh, the adversary cannot simply remove uh, either the standard or the post-quantum digital signature. You can't take a message signed with a hybrid signature and just take the, uh, say, RSA part and say, here, I've got a valid RSA signature uh, without um, it being noticed. And the other, the strong non-separability means that you can't even um, verify uh, just the RSA without uh, verifying the, uh, say, dilithium or vice versa. So the way they do it is, um, if you look at uh, all um, uh, fiat um, uh, constructs, such as the lithium and also ECDSA, um, you generate a random number, then you um, do some kind of uh, calculation like uh, uh, signing it and or exponentiation. And then um, that's a, uh, I think in the lithium it's called W, then you have uh, um, uh, you combine it with the uh, message or hash of the message and uh, get something called C. And then you do yet another calculation that involved the private key and uh, do something. Well, in ECDSA, it's called S. In uh, dilithium, I think it's called Z. So the signature is the C and the Z. And then you need the C to uh, verify uh, the Z. Um, what they do with the hybrid is uh, that uh, they don't send, they don't give you the C. Instead, they uh, sign the C. And maybe they are exponentiating it uh, with the RSA uh, um, private key and send you the RSA signature and the Z. So then you have to um, in order you, you can't uh, verify just the lithium because you don't have the C, so you can't calculate it. And if you only uh, check the RSA. I mean, yeah, you can get back the C, but you don't know that you don't have any idea that this C is related in any way to the message. So it, it could easily give you a forged uh, signature. So that's uh, the way uh, there are all sorts of variations around this, uh, but that's how um, the non separability works. So, uh, next slide. So, what does non strong non separability give us? It forces verifiers to verify both signatures. You can't uh, write uh, an apparently good implementation that only verifies uh, just the classic or just the um, um, post-quantum algorithm. And it prevents us uh, from having this uh, false sense of security that on the day that uh, the dreaded uh, cryptographically relevant uh, quantum computer comes up, we, we, oh, we're OK because everybody has uh, hybrid signatures and we're verifying both the uh, classic and the post quantum and everything is good. Well, we don't. We won't have that kind of um, false sense of security. Okay. So uh, next. Okay. The con is uh, that we lose backward compatibility. You can't use your old uh, hardware that does RSA or your old hardware that, or well, your semi-old um, hardware that does the lithium uh, to. Uh, very sad these things because they're all mixed up. And as uh, Mike Onsworth um, uh, mentioned, it's it's probably some of those constructs are going to kill your uh, FIP certification because the com the combination is not uh, uh, FIPS acceptable. And uh, I think there's just one more slide. Yeah, so. LAMPS is not doing the hybrid signature work at the moment. So where does this go? 
Okay, thanks, Yorav. Uh, Bas? Hopefully, I didn't put you Bas Westwin, Cloudflare. Um, the lithium is not fiat Shamir, uh, and the, the uh, signing algorithm you describe in the draft in, three, in section 312 is insecure because it doesn't check, doesn't mm -hmm. do the fiat Shamir with abort thing where it checks whether the, 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 uh, the Z actually leaks the private key. So I think this is a, I think this is a bad approach because you're pulling together, pulling, going into the guts of the cryptography, and then you make mistakes. Uh, I think we shouldn't do this. Okay, yeah. Mike. Mike Ellsworth and Trust. So yeah, I also became aware of this work actually after Yoav, or because Yoav published this this draft. Um, as the authors of the composite work have been working with. Um, uh, Britta Hale and Nina Bindel to try and figure out how this fits with our work. Like, so I would, to the dispatch question, I would say, let's just work together. Come join the composite team. Let's figure out how this work fits. I'm happy to invite you and, and the original authors of this paper to join. So that's my, my take on the dispatch question. Let's just smash these two things together. Um, I did want to address the point of um, whether these properties are necessary or where they fit. And so this is a discussion that's come up at PQIP, it's come up at LAMPS, it's coming up again here, is what are the cryptographic properties that particular protocols actually need? And in particular, if my, if my pair of certs are tightly bound in a certificate, do I also need them tightly bound if in the signature primitive layer is an open question I don't think we have a solid answer to. Um, and so whether to strengthen the primitive, I think depends on how you're using it, where you're using it, what you need from the primitive in context. So I open, open question here, what we need and where we need it. Yeah, do you have any, any follow up on that or should we? Um, I, I'm fine uh, joining the team. Um, I, I would ask if it's not something that we want to go, uh, go uh, through uh, CFRGs to get an um, answer. If, um, if constructions that we're making are actually doing, uh, uh, fulfilling the promise of non separability. But it, does, but it is yeah, something I mean, that uh, we. We have a CFRG and, draft for chem combiners. This feels, in a way, parallel to that. Mm -hmm. Signature combiners and chem combiners sort of feel like they ought to be CFRG. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ecker. Hi, Eric Rascola. Um, uh, from what I can tell, this is a potentially correct answer to the wrong question, um, which is the question it appears to be asking is how do we do hybrid signatures correctly? And the answer is you're not doing hybrid signatures at all. Um, and so doing it correctly is not important. Um, say, uh, say that again, but yeah, slowly. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, so um, as I said, this appears to be the answer to the answer, attempted answer to the question, how do you do hybrid signatures correctly? And my thesis is you should not do hybrid signatures at all. Um, and I, I think I, I've, I've gone into some, some length in the SAG list, but um, I think you're seeing some of the problems here, which is that they're not that no no hybrid signature is interoperable, um, as you have to be switch hitting have to and and you have as you have to have switch hitting um, implementations, and so that creates a whole additional bunch of complexity. And we already have the ability to switch hit between post quantum and classical, and so what's actually required is a different set of systems um, where you have where utilizes that rather than trying to glue everything into one thing. Um, so um, okay. I appreciate there's been some work in lamps, but I think that work is in fact misguided. So um, mm -hmm. I don't think so. I, I think that's probably like the wrong question. Okay, thanks. Um, I can't hey, say that. Uh, I can't say that in right, my draft right, to say that to say that uh, I'm not taking any position about whether um, hybrid signatures are a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not convinced they're a good thing, but I'm thinking that if they're if we want to do them, then uh, we should make the both signatures mandatory. And mandatory not by a should in the draft, but by uh, really uh, making the algorithm enforce it. Stephen. Thanks. Stephen Farrell, yeah, I, I agree with Ecker. I think uh, I'm just not convinced that this hybrid signature thing is that useful. Obviously, people are disagree and they want to do work on it. So I, I, think, I think the right dispatch thing is probably to sit back and relax for a couple of years. Um, and when we're, when we're done being relaxed, then maybe have a buff about what, what do you really need to do in this space that it, as it affects IETF protocols with much more focus on specific applications and protocols as opposed to just saying, here's a thing we could do to bastardize PKI even more. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Well, I think if, we, wait, if we sit back and wait a few years, then uh, we might be uh, so um, comfortable with dilithium that we won't need to uh, combine it with any RSA or ACDSA or any of the classic ones. Yeah, and yeah, just to respond, I think that and maybe that would be fine. And maybe it wouldn't even be dilithium by then. It might be some other signature algorithm. Okay, Tim. So yeah, um, I think this is actually very interesting work. Uh, I also learned about this uh, through your uh, bringing it to our attention. So uh, it's, I really appreciate that. Um, the separability problem is one that I hadn't really thought about before, uh, despite there being a lot of discussion of these dual signature schemes. Uh, I mean, they've existed in previous uh, crypto transitions. I don't think this one, I think this one probably needs this figured out faster instead of slower. So, you know, uh, we could sit around for two or three years, but that's basically the same as killing it. And we should probably just decide to not do it now instead of taking the wait and see approach. Um, I think uh, the trip through CFRG to figure out whether this actually works correctly and sort of clear up some of the questions about does this violate PIPs or not? And can you do this? And um, there's, there's enough of that sort of researchy type thinking that I think going you know, I, I think the people who are working on this in LAMPS should definitely pay close attention to this stuff. And uh, it may affect, it may actually give us a lot of useful information about what is the correct approach there uh, if it's not the one that uh, went down. Uh, but one of the things that I did want to get up to say is uh, these sorts of discussions are not dead at LAMPS. I actually said that at PQIP and I wanted to say that again here, just that people don't misunderstand. Uh, there was a draft that failed an adoption call, but the, you know, uh, just because one draft fails doesn't mean that the problem is uh, dead. It's still kind of, you know, something that LAMPS is very actively looking at. And the, the problem has just turned out to be harder with more considerations than uh, I think people anticipated up front. So I think this is extremely useful. Uh, I like a lot of the stuff that's in the draft. So uh, we should continue it somewhere. I think CFRG is not a bad idea. Thanks. Uh, Scott. Uh, Scott Fleur. Uh, Cisco Systems. Uh, this what this draft does is basically takes two different signature al algorithms and basically welds them together so that into one Frankenstein. Quite frankly, uh, this is the sort of thing that CFRG has to review first to make sure it's done correctly. Uh, either, I, as far as I can see, either do send it to CFRG or just saying we're not going to work on it. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Hoylands, Cloudflare. Um, is this the same as channel binding slash compound authentication, um, which is a topic I, I sometimes bring up at the ITF to uh, uh, resounding crickets? Um, I, I feel like this is like a solved problem in the mathematical sense. Yeah, I don't think it's really uh, related to channel binding. Um, it's a proof that as long as one of the signatures is correct, then both were generated honestly. Um, I think you're required to check them both. Otherwise, you can fool. I, I can fool. An adversary can fool you with a fake signature without even seeing a message. Right, but the, the property you want, the, the thing you want to prove, is not that both have been checked. It's that they're both honest or that they were both honestly generated. Oh, well, how would you know without checking? I mean, yes, but that's what you put the channel binding in for. Hmm. I don't know, channel binding is... The, the, the channel this binding is, is all a proof. The same layer. Yeah. Uh, well, I can see the it's analogy. two authentication protocols, one with a hmm. uh, classical signature and one with a post-quantum signature. And so you can say it's hmm. two protocols and each proves that the other is valid. Hmm. I have to think about that. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. Roman. 
I don't know what it says that I'm now offline. I mean, it's, <laughs> that's fine. It is late in the afternoon. I do feel like that. <laughs> more coffee. Uh, so I just want to ask a, a clarifying question because it struck me that this draft was uh, was talking about at least three different things. Uh, the first thing that struck me, it, it sounded like that there were some and this may be the wrong term, exploratory crypto that we want to get some confidence in. And like we would want CFRG to help us do that. It didn't seem like we could do that in LAMPS. Then it seemed, you know, reading a lot more in a draft that there are representational issues of how we would use that, those new crypto primitives in terms of kind of formats. And then there seemed like uh, there'd be, you know, the right practices for how would we would recommend to, to do that. Is that the right way to read all the things that's getting put in this draft? Um. I think there's not all that much. It's just about how you combine uh, two signatures. I mean, you, they don't even really have to be one. Uh, none of them have to be post quantum. It's just uh, the only use case that we have. Um, but it's just about combining them in a way that's, um, that they both have to be verified. OK, John. Hi, yeah, I'm John Gray from Entrust. So as one of the authors of the composite signatures draft that failed adoption, um, I guess part of what what came out of this was right, you know, you've pointed us to this uh, document, this non-separability property. So I guess partly what we want to know, is this an important property that needs to be added? Because we are happy to look at this. The other thing I'm thinking mm -hmm. about is so we're not giving up on that composite signatures draft. So that that draft right now is the keys are separable. They could be weakly non-separable, but also maybe there's room to pour this draft as well, right? Maybe there, there will be use cases where you want a strongly non-separable algorithm to be used for specific use cases. And there's probably many others that you don't need that property, right? So mm -hmm. I think there's definitely room for us to work together um, to come up with, um, yeah, composite mm -hmm. signatures that, that solve those problems, so. Where, where do you think so, they should yeah, go? Yeah, ideally, I, I agree that ideally this is the Highlander motto. This, there should only be one. I mean, if, if the uh, well, it uh, depends if LAMPS candidate it. draft is continuing, then this should be folded into it, if it's yeah, but uh, I mean, at all a desirable property. But I think, I think it depends if you need that property. I don't think anyone, I mean, if, if we knew this like two years ago that this was a property that people wanted, of course we would have looked at this, right? We, we haven't heard that. And even, even on the chat, I'm not sure if there's some discussion about that. So please let us know if this is a property that's needed the non-separability. Mm -hmm. But like you said, Yo, it possibly requires some changes to the underlying algorithm routines and maybe it's not a black box solution. We're looking for like FIPS approved black box solution mm -hmm. that can fit these things in there, right? So, but maybe, well, maybe not. Maybe that's not what the answer is, right? So some anyway, of the combinations are black. Box let's work together solutions. on solving this problem. Sure. Okay. Philip. Yeah. Hi, Phil Baker. Yeah, I think this is really interesting, <clears throat> and I cannot think of a use for it. Sorry. Uh, if I wanted to do this, well, I would put something in the signature manifest to say, "Hey, there's two signatures. Check them both." I wouldn't want to deal with another bit of crypto. Um, if I go into a different set of crypto algorithm, well, then I've got to, I lose my certification of my signature, my hardware security modules and so on. And, you know, it just strikes me that at this point, what I want is hardware security modules that do dilithium as soon as possible and maybe something mm -hmm. else. I don't want to put something else on the table for people to wait to implement that before they start work on it. You know, it, it just doesn't seem to be useful. And I think that it could get in the way of other stuff. So I, I, I'm with Steve Farrell. Let's just wait on it for two years or whatever. Um, just uh, for clarification, the thing you want us to wait on forever is hybrid signatures, not necessarily hybrid signatures with strong non separability. Okay, so we are running out of time here, and we don't want to cut into the other drafts. We have come to a, a, a one more in queue. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Theater. What, is Theater here? Thank you. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, Peter Campbell, UK NCSC. Um, so uh, non-separable signatures, 
do seem to require changes to the component algorithms. Um, this can lead to vulnerabilities. So for example, if you take the dilithium and ECDSA construction that's in the draft, this, a bug there. Emits, yeah. this emits the um, rejection sampling from dilithium. So uh, signatures will leak information about the private key. Um, integrating rejection sampling is not straightforward. You need to redo not just the dilithium steps, you have to redo the ECDSA steps. So it, it's not a it's not a straightforward solution. Um, so I think if, if it is something that people want to see, then it needs to go to CFRG for that analysis. Okay, thank you. The consensus seems to be uh, starting in CFRG for advice, Sorry. and then when ready, dispatch to LAMPS. Uh, so what LAMPS has previously said is that they are willing to continue kind of talking about what these kind of classes of signatures are. We're going to start in what we heard was, uh, or at least what I, what I heard, uh, was that there's kind of questions about kind of the approach. I think we're only going to get, the, get those answers from CFRG, depending on kind of where we are and depending where the parallel thread that's continuing kind of LAMPS kind of goes, there may be an intersection there. So, so Roman, I, I was sitting here listening to the discussion and I heard overwhelmingly, no, yeah. we don't need this. And that, uh, I mean, I'm just an observer, but that's what I was hearing here rather than, yeah. you know, sit on it or wait or anything else. I mean, sit on it and wait for a couple of years is basically no thank you yeah. by my interpretation. And I heard that from many people. So, yeah, I don't know. But, um, Martin, most yeah. of the no that we've heard was about... Uh, no, we don't need hybrid signatures. Right. So we're. Uh, I'm not denying that th there was pushback, certainly strong pushback about whether we want to do that. But if the authors want a next step, they can go to CFRG to answer kind of some of these unknown kind of questions uh, about the security properties relative to that. And I want to reiterate what the LAMPS chairs uh, were kind of saying is that there's an in-flight activity to kind of explore that. I'm again, not saying we're, there'd be a wholesale kind of adoption of that, but depending on how that conversation would, would go, there would be an opportunity to re-inject that into the conversation. And uh, that, yeah, that's why I said when ready, which may be never. Can I, can I quickly comment on this? Okay, go ahead, Chris, but after that, we're done here. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, thanks, Chris Wood. Um, uh, while it seems reasonable to take this to CFRG, um, uh, that group is already overloaded with a tremendous number of documents. And if it's not work that is actively wanted or needed on the IETF, I think it would be harmful to that group to bring it there. So um, I, 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 I think we should first establish if this is something we need, and then, uh, and only then, should we bring it to the CFRG to work on it. Um, okay. Please, please talk with the CFRG chairs before you send it there. Yeah, I mean, the dispatch result uh, will include that that was the vibe about the needed kind of utility, but a next step, again, this is about giving next, next steps to the document authors and, and that could be one of those steps. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ben. Hi, Ben Schwartz, Meta. Um, this document is called RESAV or RESAV, we don't know. Uh, apologies if you've seen this before, or if you're going to see it again, there has been a little bit of a mix up and we've ended up with maybe too many sleep speaking slots, but this is probably the most important one. I think SEC Dispatch is the right place. Next. So uh, the, the starting point here is that site to site IPsec, um, usually we say like site to site IPsec tunnels, but IPsec doesn't only do tunnels, um, is, is pretty great. Um, it defeats uh, IP spoofing, because if you get an IP address that was supposed to come through the tunnel, it comes outside the tunnel instead, then uh, you can just drop it. At least maybe you can just drop it. 
Uh, it's good for security. It's tamper resistant. It's good for privacy if you decide to turn on encryption, which is well supported. Um, it's very well understood. It's very fast. Uh, anybody, any pair of networks can use it, right? There's no particular need for me to be like your BGP peer or whatever. Any, any pair of networks who want to set up a site-to-site -site IPsec tunnel can do so. Let's see how that works. Next slide. Uh, so here's the protocol for setting up a site-to-site -site IPsec tunnel. You send an email and you say, I'd like to set up an IPsec tunnel with you. And like, here's, we're going to do IPv2 and here's my gateway. And the, some the, your like network administrator on the other side says like, okay, that sounds great. And, and we're only going to send traffic through that. And here's my client certificate or something like that. Uh, so this works. This is not considered a violation of the end-to-end -end principle, right? Like packets are still flowing end-to-end. -end. There's a tunnel in the middle. That's okay. Um, so that protocol exists. Next slide. But uh, it isn't very widely used. And my thesis about why it's not very widely used is that it's, uh, it doesn't scale very well. So what if we automated that process? What if we said, uh, we, did, we took that exchange that Alice and Bob had, had and we turned it into a machine readable config file. And then we just published those in the RPKI database. And the RPKI database, I've learned, is supposed to be synced by all participants in the right. network. Every AS that's participating in the RPKI syncs the entire database every 24 hours. And so what, you know, within 24 hours, everybody in the world will know your config, which would include things like the IP address of your IPv2 gateway. And RPKI provides a root of trust and an identity system, a PKI, that allows you to uh, securely negotiate, authenticate the, the IPv2 handshakes. It provides the information about which IP ranges are uh, allowed for each participant. So I know if I'm getting an advertisement from, from another party, whether it's allowed or not. Um, and the result is that with, uh, if, if N parties in the network each produce one of these configs and turn on a gateway of this kind, we could get N squared IPsec associations as they all talk to each other and protect all of their inter-AS traffic through the network. That's the heart of this proposal. That's the idea here. Everything else is really details and very much subject to change. It's, uh, the rest of it is really about, OK, if we really tried to do this, what difficulties would we run into in terms of scaling IPsec to a very large number of networks, very complicated networks, um, networks with very high reliability requirements in terms of turning things on and off and running running A-B tests and, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so, and, and to SEC Dispatch, I think the, the real question here is, you know, does this sound intriguing to you? Would you like to live in a world where somebody who taps the backbone doesn't see client IP addresses? They only see effectively information that amounts to this AS is sending a packet to this other AS and all the other information is encrypted. Um, because right now that information is all in clear text, unprotected on the backbone. Anybody can see it, anybody can spoof it, and, uh, and there's a lot of misbehaviors that, that come out of that. Next slide. Do you wanna take questions now? Like, is, is, you can wait, okay. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so this is just a diagram showing that. Again, there's, a, there's a, an internet registry that, that produces these things and maybe local registries. You've got your two ASs that then, uh, do an IKV2 exchange between what we call the control servers, and then all of their border routers would be configured to, uh, to run IPsec in some potentially pretty complicated configuration, but within the IPsec specifications. And if the current IPsec specifications aren't quite up to snuff, then we can maybe you know, define some extensions as needed. Uh, next slide. This is some details of the current proposals. We've defined a transport mode and a tunnel mode. Um, in principle, we only need one mode, but we define both of them because they, it seems like they both can work. Um, I, uh, in particular, there's been a lot of discussion about whether the transport mode with authentication header is viable or whether people hate the authentication header too much and cannot be, it's like radioactive. Uh, I don't know, it doesn't seem that bad to me, but um, so there's, there's trade-offs here in terms of like overhead and, and performance, but that is all really details. Um, and I'm sure will change if this goes anywhere. Next slide. 
So uh, RISAV really treats the internet as a network of networks, right? Because the internetwork communications in this model changes. It is not the same as the end-to-end -end communications. The packet is mutated as it exits the source AS, and that mutation is inverted as it uh, enters the receiving AS. Um, but in my view, that is consistent with the end-to-end -end principle, maybe even is, is really supporting it by providing some cryptographic oomph behind that idea. Then we're running out of time okay. very quickly. So do you want to, but is there an So I, I think I, that's the last slide. Okay. So let's stop there. OK. Stephen. So just, just a question. So I, I remember like many years ago, Savvy was a, a thing that was proposed, and it had a bunch of downsides, which I've forgotten in terms of traceability and censorship and so on. Is there, how is it not the case that some of those apply here also? I, I can't speak to Savvy specifically, but most source address validation uh, proposals thus far have been what are called control plane proposals. So they, they essentially talk about how networks negotiate relationships with each other. This is a data plane proposal, meaning that this is essentially a, a TLS style Mac and encryption potentially that applies to each packet. And so it adds overhead both computational and, um, and bandwidth, because it expands those packets. So, so I, I, I guess in the terms of dispatch, I'd kind of like to understand the answer to that kind of, those kind of questions before figuring out how I would uh, dispatch. OK. John. Hey, John Scudder, Juniper Networks. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not a network operator, um, but it strikes me that um, the difference, so, so first of all, I think that, you know, your, your solution for the introduction problem, great. Yeah, that's what the RPTI does well. I agree. Um, I'm concerned about deploying this thing at scale between ASs. Sort of you, you, you let in with like IPsec between sites is awesome. I agree. Um, the scale of uh, large, oh, by the way, um, probably most of the people who are um, actively deploying RPKI are large ASs. So the, the volume of traffic that's going to be passing between these people is um, orders of magnitude greater than, than the um, you know, previously solved problem. Um, and then the second observation is the people who are going to have this treatment applied to their traffic are essentially not opting in, um, which would also concern me. Um, I apologize for not directly answering the how do we dispatch this question, but th there are some concerns here. Yeah, on the second point, I would say, you know, this preserves the end-to-end -end property. I believe, I, I feel, in my view, it's, it's like compliant with all the IPRFCs in that sense. Ted. Uh, Todd Hardy, uh, occasional Nanog reader. Um, I, I think if you went back to the uh, email version of this, it would be a little bit cleaner. Uh, I, I really appreciate the, the fact that you're pointing out uh, exactly where uh, this particular form of, of encryption is added and removed, because that's it's, it's always nice to have clarity is around it, that. Is this a slide um, you're but I for? think one of the interesting things here is you have corp1 and corp2.example, and those very likely aren't LIRs. Those are probably customers of LIRs. Yes. And so you have the typical RAR, LIR, uh, um, customer thing. And I think there's an operational piece to this where this would require some coordination between uh, the customer and the LIR either to add a new part to the RPKI or to give them an AS. So or, this would only be for use by ASs. Well, but I'm not sure that's the problem that actually wants solving, right? It's not the same problem Alice and Bob are solving in particular, because Alice and Bob are solving customer to customer and you're replacing that by something that's LAR to LAR. So uh, I'm imagining, in, in my Im imagination, these are big corporations that have their own ASs. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that's, as, as it's been pointed out, that's not necessarily the, the, the sort of solved problem status quo for IPsec tunnels. That's another order of magnitude or two up. Okay, so I, I will point out that you, you kind of don't say that in your, in your, in your slides. And if you're going to say only customers large enough to also be ISPs could use this, that's a very different problem space and a very different set of potential users. And I, I will point out, if you try and use this outside of that, then you have multiple customers 
who pass through the LIR to LIR tunnel as ISP to ISP. Um, and that's not something that they can detect is going on. They don't know it's happening in the same way that the operations staff of a customer to, or of, of Corp 1 to Corp 2 knows when Alice and Bob have set it up. Sorry, so it, I, it's, it's something where I feel like you, you haven't got the, the, the use case actually kind of uh, <coughs> written out quite right. And I would suggest dispatching it. I, I, I would get to the question to, to one of two places. Uh, go and talk to, to Nanog Ripe or, or some of the folks which actually uh, uh, contain a lot of LIRs and see what they, they think about it. And it, it might actually be worth talking to the Aaron policy list because there's a huge number of people on that list that think pretty deeply about how RPKI can and can't be used. Thanks, Ted. Uh, Alex. Uh, hi, Alex. Sorry, guys, I, I closed the mic. Uh, so. Hi, Alex Ronofsky, sorry. Um, I don't have an answer to the dispatch question. I mostly wanted to comment that I agree with what was just said, that I think we're solving a problem which is poorly defined. Um, I think the example here that the users that would want to benefit from this currently have, like, yes, a very manual process, but they're not the ones likely with the AS. And while, uh, Ben, what you're saying about this doesn't violate the end-to-end -end principle in terms of, like, it doesn't violate any of the RFCs, that I think is technically true, but not a useful statement. I think that this doesn't give you any of the end-to-end -end principles for the, any of the guarantees that you would actually want, right? It's not observable to me as a user of a network which is participating in the proposal that these benefits are happening, right? And I think that's really the important part. So what I would want to see is to come back with a clearer use case of when we would benefit from this and how we would address some of the operational concerns that come out of that. Cause like the immediate thing I saw when you see this gateway thing is like, cool, we just lost all of our entropy on our five tuples. So like now all of your links are going to go down. So like, I don't think this added encryption and the benefits that you get from like hiding IP addresses on the backbone is better in this world than if we were to do something like the mask tunnel of tunnels that has been proposed in the mask working group. Okay, thanks Alex. David. David Skenazi, IPsec enthusiast. Um, for real though. Um, so routing security is not something I know much about, but the one thing I know about it is that it, apparently it's really hard. Um, and part of the reasons for that is, you know, like key management is hard and also uh, routing tables are really big. This sounds like you're com in a way kind of combining both of those difficult problems and, you know, having O to the N squared, like you say, like, my intuition is probably completely off, but I, you know, I think some things will melt here. So I would second what Ted said, which is talk to the actual operators and get a feel for, oh yeah, we absolutely need, need this, let's do this. Or our brain just melted and our routers then did too. And once oh, we- Yeah, get this would melt signal, all the routers. Absolutely, you have to double the number of routers in the world. Um, like. I'm fine with that because I, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, you're fine with that, but the operators might not be. So... And the router vendors might be fine with it too. Yeah, so unless the operators are actually, you know, interested in employing this, I would say come back with their positive message and then we would consider it IETF. But until we have that, I would dispatch it there. Okay, thanks, David. Okay. Hey, Urquish Cola. Um, yeah, everything old really is new again, because um, this actually reminds me really much of the like original vision of IPsec. Um, <laughs> um, um, so I, I think my comment would be much the same as David's, which is this seems like an interesting idea, um, which maybe we could workshop, but that's not worth doing unless anybody wants it. So I think what I would want to see would be some people who like push regional amounts of bits come and say they would want to do it. Um, and then like that, I'd be very, very interested. But until then, I'm kind of not so interested, except as an academic matter. Thanks, Secker. ADs. Paul Artis, um, speaking as AD. Um, I wanted to remind people that there is a routing working group called the Source Address Validation in yeah. Intra-Domain and Inter-Domain Networks, which seems to be exactly the problem you're describing, and you have a solution. So it seems that if this should be dispatched anywhere, it should be dispatched to that routing group, maybe. Um, I suspect it's out of charter as written. Okay, so um, so we can propose a mailing list where this can be discussed if we if we're not sure about whether or not um, this falls within that charter or not. Okay. 
Go ahead. And the other problem would be bringing in the expertise. So it was important to present here so that security people would be aware to combine uh, those knowledge sets. I, I can give you the, the one and a half sentence from a data tracker because it also doesn't load for me, but I have the scope of the Ceph networking group includes the Ceph functions for both intra-domain and intra-domain networks and the validation of both IPv4 and IPv6. Dot, 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 dot. Okay, so we're running out of time. So um, thanks, Ben. Um, I think that we can discuss it on the mailing list. Um, Justin, we don't have time, unfortunately. Yeah. It's like we're, we're done, right? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. There's a new mailing list, Whimsy, W-I-M-S-E. Uh, uh, don't let nerds name things. It's always cute. Um, for uh, workload identity across multi-system environments, if any of those words sounds interesting to you, uh, come join the mailing list. We'll be dropping um a use cases doc on there soon we're just dusting it at this point and uh to get it up there and uh we hope to do a boff at ietf 118 in prague it remains to be seen whether this is art area or sec area or whatever and so yeah roman go ahead right that was the key detail i i wanted you to kind of say that you're thinking about maybe a boff uh you have the mailing list if that topic interests you we would love that signal about this whether this is boffable or there's, you have interest in the bot. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. I'm sorry about that. Okay, uh, Roman, uh, last, last word for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of as the last word I wanted to take is uh, to remind everyone, uh, I think a year and a half ago, we defined something uh, formal related to rotating leadership in Sec Dispatch, responding to the community's kind of interest to make sure that we have kind of fresh folks kind of coming into it and we don't have or lock in working group chairs to constantly work, constantly continue running this working group. And we put ourselves in a situation where we had a profound thank you to very successful working group chairs, first Richard Barnes uh, and Kathleen Moriarty, who agreed to, you know, to this rotation plan and take these high visibility position and you know, consciously step down to give opportunities kind of for others. And consistent kind of with this plan, Richard rotated out. And again, consistent with this plan, uh, you know, Kathleen will also be stepping down uh, after this particular meeting and we will be identifying a new chair for when we meet in Prague. So with that, I wanted to really publicly thank Kathleen. You've been at this for a very, very long time. And and helping us steer the direction of that working group. So really kind of kudos. Thank you for making sure that we, we triage SEC work and make sure it kind of lands right and really help us bring in new ideas uh, into the organization, which, which is something we very much focus on. Thanks, Kathleen. Thank you. And just to wrap up for my last time, the first draft on X509 client certificates was dispatched to LAMPS. The second draft on hybrid signature method requires some AD action for discussion with the CFRG chair to begin with. And uh, RISAV draft from Ben, I think create a new mailing list is the action and SAVNET is a possibility. And then Justin provided for his draft that was not presented that there is a new mailing list. <laughs> I didn't quite get the acronym down. Whimsy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, put it on the mailing list yep. for Sec Dispatch. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you all. Which compression?